Hello everyone, this is Jaydeep Kolape. I'm the manager of Advanced Microscopy and Imaging Center at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Before I begin my talk, I would like to acknowledge uh, and appreciate the effort that has been put forward by the organizers of uh, Botany for You for arranging this uh, science forum and uh, also giving us uh, people like us an opportunity to uh, present the work that we have been doing in the science and technology and also in the research. So uh, thank you so much for organizing this science forum and I hope uh, that uh, through my talk or through uh, uh, other talks, uh, uh, the students uh, or the upcoming scientists, uh, they get to uh, learn a lot more about what all technologies or what all research going on uh, around the world. and. Uh, Hopefully you will enjoy the talk. So let me share my slides with you all. All right. Okay. So again, uh, this is Jaydeep Kolape. I'm the manager of Advanced Microscopy and Imaging Center at University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Uh, we are located in the Knoxville city at the state of uh, Tennessee in the United States of America. Uh, being a microscopist, of course, the title of my talk is Science Through the Lens. You might have also seen that uh, in the brochure of this science forum. Uh, for my facility over here, uh, we have Instagram as well as our Twitter account. So make sure to make sure to follow those accounts uh, because we often post the micrographs uh, uh, that we generate here at the facility and we also write some small description uh, and over there on those accounts you can also ask us questions about the micrograph that we are posting or if you would like to know more in detail about a particular microscopic technique uh, so feel free to follow those accounts uh, also at the end of my talk uh, i'm going to share my contact information so if you have any question regarding this talk or uh, any other microscopic questions or if you need any help in your research uh, feel free to email me uh, and then i'll be more than happy to uh, help you in the way that i can so before uh, i begin my talk i would like to give an outline of my talk so uh, because i'll be talking about different microscopes and microscopic techniques uh, first i would like to discuss more about how we see things around us in the world because everything in the world of microscopy is related to the light source or to the energy source that is that is interacting with the object or with your sample and based on different light sources then we have different types of microscope and based on that uh, the image is generated uh, so to understand that first, I would like to talk about how we, with our own eyes, see the world uh, and how the light help us to see different colors and uh, to see around us and how then these things are incorporated uh, in this uh, scientific field or in the microscopy field to uh, build different microscopes and different microscopic techniques. So first, I'm very sure you all know this, but I would still like to go over it one more time uh, with you all. Uh, so this is the basic anatomy of the eye. I'll be highlighting only three parts for this talk. That is pupil, lens, and retina. Uh, so how do we see things around us? So what happens, the light that is coming from a particular object is being directed by the pupil onto the lens and then lens focuses that light uh, coming from that object on the surface of the retina and then retina sends out the signal to the brain and then brain processes that signal and that's how we see things around us uh, so again even here you can see how light is playing an important role and of course being a microscopist i'm very much interested in the lens and so you can see how the lens is focusing that light onto the surface of retina. Uh, now you imagine if something is wrong with this lens, uh, if the lens is distorted or something is wrong with the lens, then that lens is not going to focus that light appropriately on the retina. 
And then uh, ophthalmologists, then they recommend you to wear contact lenses or they prescribe a contact lens for you or they prescribe uh, some kind of glasses for you, uh, which helps uh, in correcting the light that is being focused by the lens on the retina. And that way we can get, the cre get clear resolution of the object or the, of the image that we are seeing. So these different sets of lenses are basically helping uh, uh, us to see objects more clearly. Uh, talking about light, we all know that light travels in the form of wave. Uh, so this, there can be longer wavelengths of the light or there can be very shorter wavelength of the light. But uh, this particular area uh, is called the visible spectrum of the light. Uh, and that's the wavelength of the light that we can see with our eyes. Uh, and that's why it is called visible spectrum. Uh, so our eyes can see somewhere from about 400 nanometer wavelength to about 700 nanometer of the wavelength. And the light that we get from the sun, the white light is mainly comprised of uh, these uh, wavelengths, uh, the visible light spectrum. Uh, speaking about the property of light, uh, the important aspect of the light is how it interacts with the object. Uh, so for example, if we consider this blue structure, blue rectangle here as a particular object, and if the white light uh, is falling on this object, then there are three ways that light can interact with this object. And those are, uh, let's consider this incident light as the white light coming from the sun. If the light is being completely absorbed by this object and nothing is being reflected back, if the light is completely absorbed by the object, then we see that object as black object. If the light transmitted through that object without being absorbed or without being reflected, then we see that object as the transparent object because the light is passing through it. So we can see through it. Uh, and if the light is being reflected by that object, let's say in this case, if this white light is falling on this object and that if that entire white light is being reflected by this object, then we see this object as the white object. Uh, so how we see colors then? Because we've, now we know that this white light, the visible light, have different spectrums all the way from this blue spectrum to the red spectrum. Uh, and we all know the colors of the rainbow. So it is, it is made up of, uh, it's basically the visible light spectrum that we see. So when the part of the light, let's say is being absorbed by the surface and part of it is being reflected, then we are going to see some colors uh, instead of seeing it as a white light. Uh, for example, right here, if the white light is falling on this leaf surface, then what happens, we know that the white light is comprised of this uh, rainbow color, which is whip gule, that is red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Uh, what happens is the other wavelengths of the light that is red, orange, yellow, blue, indigo, or violet is either being absorbed or is it being transmitted through the surface, but only the green light is being reflected and that is what is being detected by our eye and that's how we see this leaf as green in color. And uh, basically that's how we see different colors. Uh, around us. The same phenomenon can be applied or is being utilized in the microscopy world. And that's how the researchers designed different staining protocols, designed different dyes, uh, because they wanted to highlight one structure versus the other. So let's say a researcher wanted to highlight a nucleus within a cell, then they will stain that nucleus. Let's say green fluorescence protein, uh, which is green in color. And then they stain rest of the cell with let's say some blue dye, uh, which is being excited by UV. Then 
the, because of this phenomenon, it, the way the light reflects or the way the light is emitted, then we can collect the green fluorescence separate from that of the blue fluorescence or the blue light. And that's how you know that this is the nucleus located inside the cell. Uh, that's how folks utilize this uh, mechanism in building the microscope and also while using different microscopic techniques when they are uh, working on their samples. Another important phenomenon of the light is when light interacts with different surfaces, it, it diverts or it bends in different direction or at a different angle. Uh, and you might have already heard this in your classes earlier in your school about the incident angle or about the reflected angle. So this is a classic example that this fisherman here, he wants to hunt the fish. Uh, the fish is actually located here. Uh, but however, the light that is coming from that fish, it interacts with the surface of this water and then it bends. And then the fisherman here, he feels, he thinks, or he gets this visual illusion that the fish is located somewhere here and uh, if he's and then he's going to aim at the fish somewhere over here to hunt that fish uh, hunt that fish down however the fish is actually located here so this interaction of the light with different surface surfaces can create this uh, uh, visual illusion another classic example is when we put a pen or pencil inside uh, the glass uh, filled with water uh, then we often see this that uh, the pencil that is inside the water appears broken or it appears displaced from its original place where it should have been. Um, another example is let's say if we are passing this white light or the light uh, through this uh, glass piece right here, it interacts with this end of the surface first, it bends. And then again, it interacts with another surface and then it bends further. So you can see how the light path has been changed by using those glasses. And the same phenomenon has been used while building the microscope. As there are in some microscopes, uh, there are multiple lenses, multiple glasses inside within the unit of that microscope. And then the researchers or the microscopic companies, when they build the microscope, they can actually control how this light is passing through uh, these different glass structures or through, the, through these different lenses. Um, another good example is if the white light is being incident on some prism, or in this case, in, on this glass, then we know that the white light is uh, filled with the visible light spectrum for about 400 nanometer to 700 nanometers. So it has different wavelengths of the light in it. Uh, when it interacts with the surface right here, you can see based on the wavelength of the light, which is inside this white light, which, com which is comprised by this white light, the light bends accordingly. So you can see this red light or the red wavelength of the light have a different uh, angle as compared to this blue light here. And when this light travels further and hits another surface, then you can see that uh, it the, uh, the light can be uh, uh, separated based on the wavelength uh, of that light because you can again see that the red wavelength of the light bends at a different angle as compared to the blue or the violet color light and that's how we see this rainbow color uh, from the white light and this is a classic example we also see this in the nature uh, this is exactly what happens as the sunlight interacts with the water droplets uh, in the environment and that then uh, gives this illusion or that then create the, the rainbow uh, in the nature. So that was the property of the light and uh, the reason I wanted to go over it again is because this is important to understand the light source uh, while working with different microscopic techniques because when you are working on your experiment and let's say you are not sure which microscopic technique to be used then this understanding is going to help you uh, 
to select appropriate technique uh, for your experiment. Uh, now I'll talk a little bit about the history of microscopy. Uh, history of microscopy goes all the way back uh, to the invention of the glass uh, uh, because earlier uh, folks used to see uh, the structures or in this case uh, the scriptures uh, through some glass material because that glass material used to magnify uh, the image or the, the object that they were observing at. So the good example here is reading stones. This was used back in ages uh, uh, by, by folks to read the script. Uh, and you can see how it can magnify uh, the script. And uh, that's why they were called reading stones so they can be utilized uh, while reading the scripts. Uh, similar example are magnifying glasses. They were built for the same purpose. Uh, so folks will be able to read the script or if they'll be able to see uh, some some object which is not uh, been clearly seen by our naked eyes. So in 1590, because back then people were working with this different glass material, uh, arranging them to see uh, what they see uh, through it or what they see from it. Uh, uh, so in 1590, uh, father and son duo, uh, Zachary C. Janssen and Hans Janssen uh, from Holland, they were working in the glass uh, manufacturing unit and uh, they decided to place different glasses in a long tube, so different lenses in the long tube. And they wanted to see whether having those different lenses in that long tube can help us to see uh, the object uh, more magnified. And uh, this was the first compound microscope that was built in 1595. Uh, and with this microscope, they were able to magnify images up to three to 10 times than the original uh, magnification of the image. Another important name uh, in the history of microscopy is Robert Hooke, uh, who in 1665 uh, published a book called Micrographia, where he devised compound microscope and he was observing different structures under this compound microscope and he was report, reporting those structures uh, in his book, Micrographia. Uh, his, this person is very important because he's the one who coined the term cell. Uh, and the way he coined that term is uh, he was looking at the slices of cork uh, under this compound microscope and uh, then he can actually see multiple porous structures uh, in, on in the uh, slices of the cork and he was calling those structures as cell and then this term stuck around because later on other uh, researchers or other microscopists uh, they were looking at different microorganisms uh, or even sometimes the tissues under these compound microscopes and then they were calling those individual structures as cell as well uh, and now we know that we use that term quite often in the science. Another important figure in microscopy uh, is Van Leeuwenhoek. Uh, in 1673, he created a simple microscope which could magnify image up to 275 times. And then he published his drawings of for different microorganisms. Now some folk debate whether to call him father of microscope or inventor of inventor of microscope or not. Uh, the reason is because even before him, there were other folks who were working on different types of microscopes and different types of lenses. Uh, however, because he was working more on the life science and uh, uh, things like that, so some folks still call him father of microscope. So this was the microscope that Leeuwenhoek built. Uh, it was a very simple microscope. Uh, he had a lens here, some kind of glass lens. Uh, then this uh, is the sample holder and uh, he would place the sample at the tip of this sample holder. And then there were two knobs. One was sample translator. This was to adjust the place of the sample. Uh, so it comes right in front of the lens. And then there was a focus knob to get better resolution uh, and get better focal plane uh, for that particular sample. So he would just take a drop of water from the pond he will place it in front of this tip and then he will see multiple microorganisms uh, from that water droplet and he will draw the structures and was reporting those structures as microorganisms. 
uh, that's why Leeuwenhoek is uh, another very important person uh, in the history of microscopy. So as you can see, the evolution of microscopy is exactly opposite to that of evolution of life. Uh, because evolution of life, it started from the very basic units of the life and then all the way to the organism and we are still evolving. And similarly, uh, microscopy, initially the microscopies were looking at the organism and now we can go as uh, detailed as to the nanoparticle level or to the atomic level to see uh, structures uh, in our sample. And of course, the way we are evolving, microscopy is also evolving and there are like several different techniques now available and several different types of microscopes now available uh, for, for us to use for different research purposes. So there are different types of microscopes, uh, transmitted light microscope, epifluorescence microscope, confocal microscope, under confocal microscope, there are multiple techniques that can be utilized. Uh, then there's transmission electron microscope, cryo transmission electron microscope, a recent discovery which has won Nobel Prize uh, for invention, uh, then scanning electron microscope, atomic force microscopy, total internal reflection microscope and so on. So there are multiple types of microscope uh, and microscopic techniques available. And again, uh, the reason I went through the property of the light, the glasses and lenses earlier in my talk is because that is all the best to construct these different types of uh, microscopes that are available today. So everybody need to understand uh, uh, the importance or the basics of how the lenses works. Uh, I won't go much into the detailed physics about the numerical aperture of the lenses and so on in this talk, but it is important to know those aspects and uh, that, that is how you will decide which instrument or which technique that you would want to use for your particular sample or experiment. So first I would like to talk about confocal microscope. Uh, this is a Leica SP8 uh, laser scanning confocal microscope. Uh, this is what we have here at the facility. Uh, so what is confocal microscope uh, and how it works? So confocal microscope uh, requires uh, that your sample need to have some kind of fluorescence in it. Uh, and uh, there is there are like different wavelength of lasers available that can hit your sample. Uh, and then your sample will show the fluorescence and whatever the fluorescence your sample is uh, emitting that can be captured by some camera or by the detectors and that can be seen uh, in this software associated with the confocal microscope. So this is one of the example of uh, tobacco infiltration uh, of endoplasmic uh, reticulum localized GFP. Uh, this is a leaf surface of Nicotiana benthamiana. So these are the epidermal cells uh, of the leaf surface. And uh, you can see that the network of endoplasmic reticulum so clearly here. Uh, against this background and uh, against the dark background. That is the most important thing, like why we need fluorescence in the microscopy, firstly. Uh, the microscopy works best with two things. You need higher resolution. Uh, that means uh, the microscope should be able to resolve uh, two points which are located very close to each other. Uh, so you need higher resolution and second important thing is you need better contrast. So here you can clearly see because this green fluorescence protein is mainly associated with this endoplasmic reticulum network. Uh, it gives nice contrast of that endoplasmic reticulum network against the rest of the cell which is not showing any other fluorescence. Uh, the red structure that you see here is the autofluorescence from the chloroplast. And I will talk about that uh, in a bit uh, when I'm giving other examples as well. Uh, also, another advantage of using the fluorescence is you can actually quantify the fluorescence. So for example, in this image, 
uh, the fluorescence that you see in this area is much dimmer or lighter than the fluorescence that you see in this particular area which is a bright fluorescence so it tells me that there is more protein accumulated in this area as compared to this area so i can basically quantify that fluorescence uh, and there are like several different techniques you can count like in this case let's see if you want to count number of chloroplasts you can count them because they are fluorescing uh, so you can count cells you can count different structures within the cell uh, also you can do some live cell imaging because this fluorescence protein uh, can be utilized for the live cell imaging without damaging uh, the sample that much. Uh, for example, in other microscopic techniques where you have to uh, cut your sec uh, sample, uh, section your sample in those kind of cases, uh, you are damaging the sample or you are fixing the sample, that means your cell or the tissue is already dead, so you won't be seeing it in the live image itself. Whereas in confocal microscope, uh, it gives us an opportunity to look at it as a live cell imaging as well. So what is fluorescence? Uh, so there are multiple uh, things available in the nature that have this uh, phenomenon called fluorescence. That is, uh, there are some structures or uh, particles, uh, there are some structures uh, within those samples or within those objects in the nature uh, have uh, some electrons uh, in their outer state uh, which are usually at the ground state and if those electrons are hit by a particular light wavelength then those electrons migrates to the excited state level and uh, those electrons cannot stay at the excited state level for the for all the time so they start releasing some energy before they come back to the ground state again and while releasing that energy they also releases a photon or they emit some kind of light which in turn is actually the fluorescence light and uh, that's how we see the fluorescence uh, the time that the electrons take from going back from the excited state all the way to the ground state uh, is the lifetime for that particular fluorescence and again there are ways to quantify or there are ways to measure this lifetime which is in nanoseconds for individual fluorophores and there is a technique in confocal microscopy called FLIM which is fluorescence lifetime imaging uh, component of the confocal microscope which takes an advantage and measures uh, this lifetime of the fluorescence. Uh, going back like as these electrons come back to the ground state they emit the fluorescence and then that fluorescence can be seen with our eyes in case of microscope it can be seen by the camera or uh, by by some kind of detectors but again why confocal microscope because uh, these fluorescence can also be observed by simple epifluorescence uh, compound microscope uh, and you can see the price difference. The epifluorescence microscope can cost about fifty to seventy thousand um, dollars, less or more, depending upon what you have in the module of that microscope, depending upon what objective lenses you have, what filter cubes you have, and so on. Whereas the confocal microscope can cost up to one million dollar, again less or more, depending upon what is uh, included in that confocal microscope because there are like different modules that you can have uh, uh, in this confocal microscope as well. So why confocal microscope is very expensive? Uh, what makes it so special is, let's see that you are looking at a particular image under the epifluorescence microscope. Uh, so what you are doing is you are exciting, you have some fluorophores in your sample, you have some fluorescence tag uh, in your sample tagging different uh, structures of your sample. Uh, when you observe that sample under the epifluorescence microscope, basically that entire sample is fluorescing and uh, you are getting all the light uh, Sorry, from I that sample. Uh, Sorry for that. So you get the sample 
uh, you get the light from that entire sample and then you don't see the detailed structure of that sample that well. However, for the confocal microscope, uh, you will only see the light that is coming from the plane of the sample that you are focusing on. And it will eliminate all the above and below light from that focal plane. And then you see this nice uh, two dimensional structure and then you can actually see the details uh, of the sample. So how does it work? How does it make sure to eliminate that light and only to show the light from that particular focal plane? is uh, well described by this diagram over here. So in confocal microscope, uh, you have these pinholes, which are called confocal aperture, which make sure to eliminate the light that is coming from out of focus uh, plane of the sample. So for example, here, uh, if this is the specimen, this rectangle right here, and if your objective lens is focusing on this focal plane, then in epifluorescence microscope, you are getting light from this end of the sample or the specimen and also from this end of the specimen. And in epifluorescence microscope, you don't have confocal aperture. So all the light that is being collected back by the objective lens is what we see. Uh, on the detector and uh, so basically it's collecting light from everywhere. Uh, however, in confocal microscope, what it does, it, it knows where this objective lens is focusing on. So it will only allow the light that is traveling from this focal plane to go through this pinhole and that can be detected. And that's how we see that nice focal plane and we call it optical section. So you are not actually sectioning your sample it's you are just optically sectioning your sample to see only that focal plane and it eliminates all the light coming from above and below i always like to give an example uh, of uh, let's say there is a nine story building and uh, if you are observing that building from top or from outside you see all the nine floors but you don't know what is happening on individual floor uh, let's say you want to see what's happening on floor number five then you will go uh, in the elevator, press number five, and when the door opens, elevator door opens at floor number five, then you see that entire floor number five in detail. Uh, and that is exactly what confocal microscope does. Like if you are looking at one particular focal plane, you, it shows you that one focal plane. And just like in case of building, when you are at floor number five, you only see floor number five and you don't see any of the above floors or you don't see any of the below floor. Uh, and uh, now imagine like you can now move this focal plane, like you can go from floor number five to floor number four, take one picture, go to floor number three, take another picture, go to floor number two, take another picture. And when you compile all those pictures together, you can form a nice three dimensional pictures with all the details of individual floors of that building. So the confocal microscopy has that ability to move through different focal planes uh, and take images at each focal plane and form that nice three dimensional structure. So again, coming back here, this focal plane is right here. But let's say if I move the focus towards this end of the specimen, then it will only show me this line or this end of the specimen and it will eliminate all the other light that is coming from top. Similarly, if I focus only on this area, it will only show me this surface and it will eliminate all other light that is coming from the bottom. Uh, and that is, again, we call it optical section. And that's why the confocal microscopy can be used for live cell imaging because it can, the laser or the light can penetrate through uh, uh, the cell and you can see what's happening inside the cell as the cell is still alive because you are not sectioning that cell. However, later on, I'm going to talk about TEM, that is uh, transmission electron microscope, where when you want to see the details inside the cell, you first have to fix that cell. So basically you are killing that cell or you're fixing this, uh, that cell at one particular stage uh, or uh, state of the cell. And then you are going through multiple processes and you're making the sections. And then you are looking at that particular section under the transmission electron microscope. Uh, whereas for confocal microscope, you can actually see stuff moving around because cell is still alive. 
uh, and you are talk you are having different fluoro fluorescence protein tag to different organelles and you can observe them pretty well uh, so again uh, this is one of the optical section of the cell showing this beautiful endoplasmic reticulum network uh, in one optical section so this can be applied uh, to different researchers. For example, one of the researcher, uh, we got this paper published back in 2018. He was working on a beneficial fungus uh, that uh, infects uh, these uh, grasses, roots, and uh, they stay within the root cells, uh, uh, keep plant happy by providing nutrients to the plant, and at the same time, they take nutrients from the plant and keep themselves happy. So these were good beneficial fungus and the researcher wanted to see this fungus, how they interact uh, within uh, these root cells. Uh, of course, one way was to fix that sample, then do the sections and see those sections and the microscope and see how the fungus interacts within the cell. Uh, whereas the fastest way was to use these different fluorescence dyes. Uh, for example, here we use WGA to stain the fungus or the hyphae. Uh, we use propidium iodide to stay in the cell wall of those root cells. And when we merged uh, those two images together, then we could see how this particular fungus was growing inside this cell and how it's being moving to different cells while keeping the plant happy and healthy. And then we tested this on different samples to see that we are getting consistent result or not. Again, one may argue that, hey, there is this very expensive microscope. Uh, we are spending so much money on that microscope, then uh, I'll just bring my sample, I'll have some fluorescence dye, and I should be able to take picture within a minute. Uh, but uh, I'm afraid it's not the way science works. Of course, if you have a particular hypothesis and if you want to prove this, you have to run this multiple times. Uh, you need to have multiple biological replicates of your sample to make sure that you consistently see uh, those results. The reason is uh, this because I already talked about fluorescence that how it is available in the nature. For example, the green fluorescence protein that is very popular uh, in confocal or fluorescence microscopy uh, was derived from the jellyfish. Uh, and the scientists who derived that uh, from the jellyfish, they won Nobel Prize for that. Uh, but now the jellyfish has that kind of fluorescence already in it. There are some uh, quinine uh, in some uh, barks of the plant or the trees, which has the fluorescence. If you incident a particular light wavelength on that, they show some kind of fluorescence or bioluminescence. Uh, so you have to be very careful about the fluorescence that you see. For example, I'm gonna go back to this previous image, is I already said that the red structure that you see is the autofluorescence from the chloroplast. So this chloroplast is self-fluorescing. So when I know that the chloroplasts have the fluorescence in the red spectrum of the light, and that's why I can use this pretty well uh, against this GFP protein to highlight that chloroplast to show uh, the review was that we are actually looking at the leaf surface because I can see the chloroplast here as well. But what if uh, instead of green fluorescence protein, I'm using a red fluorescence protein, then how do I distinguish the chloroplast from the rest of the sample? And that's where the challenges comes from. So it's not as easy as like you take your sample, you have some fluorescence protein, and you get the images. It takes uh, time and effort and expertise to design that experiment for you. For example, introducing GFP in your sample, uh, you have to genetically modify your sample. So you either infiltrate your sample uh, with some agrobacterium so that green fluorescence protein goes to a particular target uh, and attaches to that target. And then we see that as a fluorescence or you have to go through different generations of the plant until you see the plant, which is uh, showing the fluorescence uh, that, that you desire to see. So this, the sample preparation is a long process. Uh, again, like even if you spend much time on that, it's not that you bring in one sample, take one picture and boom, you are done. No, you have to have multiple biological replicates to make sure that you are getting consistent results.
uh, and then only the data can be uh, available for publishing. And again, for this particular paper, we not only tried this with switchgrass, but we tried with signal grass, we tried with crabgrass, and again, we tried samples after samples after samples uh until we consistently see these structures and then we can say that hey yes this is the fungus this is the plant root side and this is how it's interacting with the plant by keeping the plant happy and then we can conclude this uh, as our evidence uh, and that's how the science works uh, another example is one of the researcher uh had hypothesized that his particular protein is localized to chloroplast and uh, so we decided to tag that particular protein with clean green fluorescence protein again because we know that chloroplast has this autofluorescence or self fluorescence in the red uh, light spectrum so we can use something in the green and we can see how uh, whether it is interacting with the chloroplast or not uh, so we tag that protein uh, then we captured image with the green channel we captured image at the red channel uh, where the chloroplasts were there, we use the transmitted light just to show the surface of the leaf as well. And when we combine those three pictures together, then we can see that this protein was surrounding the chloroplast. But again, we are not sure whether uh, it is exactly uh, localizing along with the chloroplast or not. And then we decided to, because this is just one single focal plane that you see, then we decided to take multiple sections or optical sections of that chloroplast because we wanted to see whether this protein is actually wrapping around that chloroplast or not and the next slide is what we saw so when we did the multiple optical sections of that chloroplast then we put that together to form this nice three-dimensional structure and then we can see we can we captured image at the green uh, channel at the red channel and then in the merge channel you can see how this chloroplast is nicely surrounding or, or this uh, protein is nicely surrounding this chloroplast over here. Uh, so that's the advantage of confocal microscope as well, that you can form this nice three-dimensional structure uh, for better explaining the localization of the protein that you are looking at uh, if you are looking uh, for the localization with particular organelle. Uh, another example is researcher here at UTK. She was looking at uh, the loci that were uh, located within the chloroplast and again you can see this red color chloroplast but as I'm and again this is the three-dimensional structure so as I'm taking out this chloroplast color and you will see that how the green fluorescence was located within uh, this chloroplast so here it goes it zooms in and then as we are taking the red color out you can see the green was inside this and when I bring it back, then it tells me that yes, it was uh, associated with the chloroplast. So this is how the confocal microscope uh, can be utilized. And again, this it takes uh, immense expertise or patience and time and multiple samples after samples to get to this particular result. Uh, also, like you can tag different organelles with different fluorescence depending upon how many detectors you have for your confocal microscopy because you need to have each detector for each fluorescence associated. So for example, we use three detectors here, one detecting this green fluorescence of mitochondria, one detecting this red fluorescence of Golgi stack, and one detecting the blue fluorescence from peroxisome. So this is the root hair. It's a single cell structure that emerges from the root. And you can see how dynamic these organelles within that root hair uh, cell and uh, how they are moving back and forth. So along with taking multiple optical section, you can actually do the time series or the time course. So you can tell confocal system that, hey, I want you to take picture at every one second for next five or 10 minutes or even for an hour or even for days. And then you can actually see how things are moving uh, inside that particular cell. So this can also be used for the live cell imaging uh, in plants as well as in animal uh, sciences. Uh, I'm showing most of the plant examples here because a uh, plant has this notorious autofluorescence and, uh, uh, and they are pretty dynamic than what uh, people imagine they to, them to be. So that's why I always like to show more plant examples than uh, animal examples. 
Next, in confocal microscope, uh, you also have an uh, ability to stitch image. So this is one picture which is comprised of 48 single high resolution images. So there are like 48 images that are taken and we can uh, tell system to uh, take images over that particular section and then it will merge it back together as a mosaic image and then it will give us one image. So if you are looking at the tissue section, uh, if you want to take a picture uh, at low magnification, you can definitely see probably that entire tissue section, but you won't see uh, better resolution of that image if you want to zoom in to one particular area to see uh, how that tissue is different from one area to other and so on. So you can always take multiple pictures at high magnification and stitch those pictures together to form this one large image. Uh, again, this can be done in two dimension or it can be done in three dimension. It takes more time to build that mosaic image uh, if you are doing it in three dimension as well, but it is quite doable by this confocal microscopy techniques. So, so this is the cross section or the corona section of the mouse nasal cavity, which is being stitched here. Uh, and uh, you can see the mosaic. Uh, also, you can, as I said, that fluorescence can be used to quantify the cell. So this is another collaboration that I did with uh, the researchers at uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln. Uh, there is DOI for this paper. If you would like to see that paper, it was published in Onco Target Journal. Uh, the folks who are looking at this uh, green fluorescence that you see here is the Lana virus particle, uh, which attacks the nucleus. And this, the blue color that you see here is actually the DAPI stain of the nucleus. And so this Lana is localized more towards the nucleus. And uh, this Lana is usually observed uh, away from some of the uh, immunity cells or the white blood cells in this case, like uh, in this area, you see more CD8 cells, but you don't see Lana in this area. Uh, and uh, so what we did is like, we took picture at the Lana region and we took picture at the CD8 or where there are more uh, white blood cells. And we were comparing how the Lana was less in those particular area because the white cells probably were able to attack uh, that Lana virus over there, or uh, maybe uh, the Lana virus like to stay away from that region. So we quantify, we measure, uh, counted the number of uh, CD8 cells here, and that is exactly what is shown here in this graph, uh, that the CD8 cells in Lana region were more as compared to CD8 cells uh, in, the, in the Lana region. Uh, sorry, the CD8 cells in the non-LANA region were more than as compared to CD8 cells in the LANA region. So you can use this fluorescence to count number of cells or to quantify the fluorescence and so on. Another example, this is another collaboration that I did with the uh, scientist at Nobel Research Institute uh, where uh, the green fluorescence protein was tagged to this uh, actin filaments and we were disrupting this actin filament by giving different treatments of latranquilin B, which is known to disrupt the actin filaments uh, within the cells. And then we were quantifying uh, the fluorescence uh, uh, based on what we see. And then we can see that on different uh, concentration of LAD-B, we saw different uh, uh, fluorescence for the actin filament. Uh, we were working on this because uh, we know that uh, we were studying plants in the space and uh, when we send plants uh, in the space we know that there is no gravity so the root uh, they don't go in the straight line they form this coil because they just turn around and we thought that something is wrong with the actin uh, of that root because it's missing the gravity. And uh, so we were looking at those mutants and we were looking at those uh, cells and we were comparing that uh, by different latrangulin B treatment because we know that this latrangulin B also affects the actin. So we are comparing those two sets to see whether something is really wrong with the actin filament or not. And you can further read this in this particular paper if you wish to.
for confocal microscopy, another brilliant uh, module is FRAP. It is called fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching. Uh, so let's say if this is your sample full of fluorescence, you can select a particular area of your sample and use very high intensity of the laser light and bleach that area away because if the fluorescence uh, is being exposed at very high laser light for a long period of time, uh, the fluorescence tend to bleach away. So we can intentionally bleach that area and uh, then we can see if that fluorescence is being recovered in that area or not. And then we can quantify that. So for example, here you can see this is before the bleaching. After bleaching in that area, this particular area, the fluorescence drops down to zero. And then we can see how the fluorescence is being recovered back. Uh, and uh, this again can be utilized to quantify the fluorescence or to see how, the, how one particular protein is uh, associated with that particular area. And once it is bleached, how it can come back to that area in the live cell imaging. Another interesting module is FRET. Uh, this is mainly utilized to see if there are two molecules or two proteins closely localized to each other or not. If two proteins are very closely localized to each other, then if you excite one protein, the emission coming from that protein has the tendency to excite another protein. So the protein uh, that donates uh, the photons or the emission to another protein is called donor. And the other one which is accepting that protein is called the acceptor. Uh, this will only happen if those two proteins are very closely localized. So there are two ways to do that. One is you bleach the signal from the acceptor and then you excite uh, your donor and see if that light is also being able to help to excite this acceptor or not. And the second way is to by using the sensitized uh, emission. Again, for techniques like this, you need expertise. Uh, and you need experience to design this kind of experiments because you need to be able to design the fluorophores uh, which are compatible uh, for this FRET experiment or not. So this is an example of FRET, uh, FRET bleaching where we can see we bleach the sample here and uh, because of the emission from this fluorescence uh, actually, the fluorescence uh, from this uh, acceptor was uh, recorded back and then you know that, uh, yes, these two um, uh, proteins were localized uh, pretty close to each other and basically then you can also quantify the distance uh, between those fluorescence proteins. So that was confocal microscope. Uh, uh, now I'll switch my gears and I'll talk a little bit about transmission electron microscope. Uh, so in confocal microscope, we know that the light source that we use is some kind of uh, fluorescence light or some kind of uh, white light uh, that can excite the sample uh, and the fluorescence that is being generated by, this, by the sample can be then captured. Uh, however, in transmission electron microscope or for that instance, scanning electron microscope, the source uh, is not light. It is basically electrons and in light we, we observe that the light travels in the waveform uh, whereas electrons does not have uh, uh, that wave like moment electrons can travel in any direction. Uh, so we have to make sure that electron travels in the straight line and that's why in transmission electron microscopy or in scanning electron microscopy uh, there are multiple magnetic lenses uh, uh, in, placed in this column and it runs under a very high vacuum to make sure that these electrons travel in the same in the straight line. Uh, so this is the JOL 1400 flash TEM that we have here at the facility. Uh, this is the sample holder. This is where you place the sample. Uh, the electron gun or the electron filament is localized at the top here. That electron filament sends samples uh, that uh, those electrons uh, are transmitted through the sample and then it is being detected here by the camera and then that's what we see on the screen uh, as a picture. The advantage of uh, using electrons uh, in place of uh, light or uh, lasers is electrons are, uh, are very tiny and uh, they have very less uh, 
lesser wavelength than the light and uh, that's why the resolution of the image that we get is much higher we can get much magnified image at very high resolution as compared to the light microscope or the confocal microscope however the drawback is uh, you cannot do the live cell imaging and there is a lot of sample preparation that goes along with the transmission electron microscope because uh, for those electrons to uh, transmit through uh, the sample, your sections need to be absolutely thin or uh, ultra thin so the electron can uh, transmit through and then we uh, get nice contrast image. So this is a basic light path for the transmission electron microscope. Uh, you have a electron gun, uh, electron source, uh, and then there are multiple lenses, objective lenses. Uh, and then you can see the electron travels uh, through this specimen. It travels in the straight line. It goes through different lenses. So the structure that we see, it can be magnified. And then you either have a fluorescent screen where you can actually see these structures or there is a camera or detector down here, which can then capture uh, those electrons and that can be seen as an image. Uh, so as I said, transmission electron microscope uh, requires a uh, lot of sample preparation. So samples need to be very thin for electrons to transmit through. Uh, you have to fix your sample. So for example, you want to uh, see a particular organelle or protein within your sample, then you first you have to fix the cell. Uh, and while fixing that, you have to make sure that you are not damaging the sample. Everything inside the cell remains intact. The common fixatives that are used are aldehydes because aldehydes tend to cross-link uh, and form this strong bond of the cross-linkage with the proteins and they, they help in uh, fixing everything as it is. Uh, so the fixation step is very important. And uh, of course, after the fixation, because you have to make ultra thin sections, uh, you have to embed your sample in a particular resin or particular plastic. And then with the diamond knife or with glass knife, you can make sections or ultra thin sections and then observe that under the microscope. Uh, so after fixation, you cannot directly go uh, do the, the embedding in the resin. You first have to dehydrate the sample then you have to embed it, then you have to section it and to get better contrast, you uh, use some heavy metals to stain your samples. Uh, and then finally you do the imaging. So for TEM sample preparation can be uh, multiple weeks long process uh, or multiple days long process until you get your final result. Uh, but again, like it's worth it because you get very high magnified images at very high resolution. So uh, it's, it's a very popular technique even today. Uh, this is one of the example. These are synaptic vesicles uh, from the rat. Uh, and you can see this scale bar is 500 nanometers. So we are actually pretty high magnified image this one is. And we are getting a brilliant resolution because of that uh, heavy metal staining uh, that used for this particular sample. Another example is scanning electron microscope. So in transmission electron microscope, you have electron transmitting through the sample, whereas in scanning electron microscope, the electron hits the sample surface and then it is diffracted back and whatever is coming back is being collected by some detector. Uh, so the scanning electron microscope is beneficial when you are looking at some surface, you cannot look within the cell in scanning electron microscope. So again, there are multiple scanning electron microscope options. Uh, there are conventional microscope, there are environmental microscope. In a minute, I will show you the environmental microscope that we have here at the facility. But in the conventional microscope, then again, you have to sputter coat your sample, put some uh, uh, metal covering on the sample so you get better contrast of the surface. Uh, but here in our facility, we have this Hitachi TM3030 environmental microscope. Uh, it's a tiny microscope, uh, pretty helpful. This does not require much of the sample preparation. It can give you magnification of up to 60,000 times magnification and it requires low vacuum for imaging as well. 
So all you have to do is just place your sample inside this chamber, apply the vacuum, and then uh, it can be detected by the software uh, associated with this uh, microscope. So this is one of the picture of the trichome from a Arabidopsis leaf that I captured by using uh, one of these environmental microscope. Of course, the images that are generated are usually black and white, but uh, I played around with this image in the Photoshop and I decided to color it, or pseudo color it, uh, so it gives more uh, real look of this uh, leaf surface and you can see this trichome nice and steady and uh, this microscope can be used for different surface anatomy. So in this case, the researchers were looking at the mutant and they were suspecting that the trichome, they were observing that the trichome uh, from this mutant are irregularly shaped as compared to the wild type. So we quickly did this analysis by using this environmental microscope and we can totally see the difference. And again, I pseudo colored this image uh, by using Photoshop for better representation. Um, there is another technique called atomic force microscopy. Uh, again, it's a different monster altogether. Uh, the molecular resolution of uh, imaging uh, force measurements. So this atomic force microscopy, the way it works is there is a lever uh, which runs over the top of the sample and it interacts with the sample surface. Uh, and then it can actually tell us the roughness of the sample and it can also resolve the sample uh, pretty well. Uh, for example, here you can see the stress fibers in human cell. You can see this acting filament as well. Uh, it's a very uh, good technique uh, to use, especially if someone wants to look at the roughness of the surface and do some measurements. So this also has a tool to analyze that data. So uh, I won't go on all other different types of microscopic techniques because this is, I just wanted to give you the brief uh, idea about uh, different microscopes. Uh, but now we, we know like it's, it's, it's like a jungle of uh, different microscopes. So how you know which microscope to select for your experiment? How you are going to decide? So this is all based on your experiment, what you want to see. Uh, what you want to analyze. Uh, this, it also depends on your sample, whether we can do the live cell imaging or not, or whether we have to fix it and whether we have to see much in the detail and we have to use the transmission electron microscope or not. Uh, also, what is available? Uh, if you don't have confocal microscope available, if you have something else, then yeah, why not? Let's take advantage of that. Uh, whether you are looking at the live cell imaging or the fixed material and what are your data analysis options as well, like whether you want to quantify the fluorescence or whether you just want to count number of cells and which can be done with basic H and E staining and all. Uh, so there are multiple factors uh, to decide which microscopic technique that can be utilized for your experiment. Uh, and for that, of course, you need some expert uh, advice. Uh, so if there is any microscopist around you, of course, definitely consult with them. Uh, I'm also going to share my information. If you have any difficulties, always uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, and uh, you need uh, experience. You need, uh, as I mentioned earlier, multiple biological replicates to make sure uh, that you are getting consistent results because microscopy is the visualization tool. So. Uh, I can magnify a nucleus and I can tell you it's a moon and uh, trust me, you'll believe it because in some cases it does look like a moon, but it's not. So you can, you can, the data can be easily manipulated uh, and the reviewers can easily uh, capture that manipulation. So make sure to have multiple uh, samples uh, done uh, and uh, you have a good data set that can be represented by this microscopy. Uh, for example, there was a researcher who wanted to see how the sample is being detached at this particular structure. And at that time, we only have the scanning electron microscope available. So I told them to do multiple images by the scanning electron microscope. And then we fixed that sample and we did the sectioning and we used simple staining. And then we can see how the surface is being detached uh, 
in case of wild type as compared to the mutant. So again, depending upon what you have, you can decide uh, what uh, technique you would like to use. Uh, sometimes researchers come to me saying that, hey, uh, this is this picture in the manuscript. I want exactly the same image for my experiment because it is similar and I feel that, okay, yes, that researcher used that technique, it's worth it. But maybe for your experiment, instead of using the TEM, let's use confocal microscope and we can see it in the live cell and, and so on. Or instead of confocal microscope, let's go to TEM and uh, let's see your data that way. So, so you need to discuss this with the experts. You need to discuss with your supervisors or with other collaborators and see what is best for uh, your experiment. Uh, so don't get lost in the jungle. Uh, try to find your path with better guide. Uh, and I'm very sure uh, you will be successful in learning and utilizing these different microscopic techniques. Uh, so again, uh, these are some of the images. Uh, you can, depending upon what you have, you can do the fixed material, you can do scanning electron microscope or confocal electron microscope. Uh, as I said, you can show anything in the microscope because it's a visualization uh, uh, tools. So this is actually the root tip of Arabidopsis uh, leaf. The green is nucleus, red uh, is some kind of fluorescence uh, staining the cell wall. Uh, but this looks like a Christmas tree. So it's very easy to manipulate data in microscopy. So make sure you don't do that and you run multiple samples until you get consistent results. Uh, with that, I will conclude my talk. Uh, so uh, I hope you enjoyed this talk. Uh, I'm very sure there will be multiple questions about this talk. So feel free to email me. These are my email addresses, jaykolape at utk.edu as well as jaydeep.kolape at gmail.com. Uh, feel free to ask me questions about this talk or if you have any other general questions, then uh, feel free to ask that. Uh, and thank you for attending this session. Uh, and I hope you guys stay safe and have a good rest of the year. Uh, thank you very much.